Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith and review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Um, and I think we have what I would consider to be the best adult education program in the United States. I know I've said that before, but I test you. Go out there and find another one that's able to deal with these programs. And why? Because we have a unique opportunity in the D.C. area to get the very best talent, the best educators, those that, are, that know the truth and are able to communicate it. And I think uh, a good example is our, our program here with the Holy Spirit with Dr. Marshner. So I ask you to please welcome back. Dr. William Marshner. Thank you, sir. Tonight, I want to get to the heart of the topic that's on the poster, namely the Holy Spirit and grace, okay? And the big question is whether the conjunction and should be in there. Okay? Is there any difference between the Holy Spirit and grace? Or are they like two names for the same thing? Okay? Well, when we look at the scriptures, it's not the clearest thing in the world because St. Paul says, for example, that the love of God is poured forth into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Well, does that mean that by giving us the Holy Spirit, God is giving us that love? Is the Holy Spirit himself the love poured forth? Or, he, or is he the one through whom it is poured forth? Hmm? It's an odd question. Well, not really. It's not an odd question at all. It's a question that jumps out of the difficulty of the texts and um, uh, clearly what we call grace in our souls has such a remarkable range of effects that you can understand why some people would have said it's, it's just the Holy Spirit in us, period. Let's look at um, Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. Who's going to be my point man on the Bible tonight? Somebody get out the little book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. Let's hear that. But when the kindness and generous love of God our Savior appeared, not because of any righteous deeds we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the bath of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out on us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that we might be justified by his grace and become heirs in hope of eternal life. That'll do it. We become recipients of his grace. We become heirs of eternal life. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us. It sounds as though we have been elevated to a new nature. And isn't this, after all, why Paul speaks of the washing or baptism of regeneration? Regeneration means new birth. What do you come into when you're born? your human nature. If you have a new birth, what are you coming into? But a new nature. And if it's brought about by the Holy Spirit, doesn't it have to be the divine nature? So we were born in human nature, but then we're elevated to divine nature. Right? Right. So it seems that grace is a permanent thing 
that is changing us the way a new nature would change us, and that is elevating us up to a new order of activity. Yeah. I love Philippians. I mean, no, Ephesians. Ephesians, where am I here? Chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Burn these words upon thine heart. Write them on your doorpost. <laughs> these are really good. Who's got it? Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Who didn't bring their Bible with them today? Oh. Mm. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Yep. Yep. It's not a matter of our doing. It's a matter of a gift from God. Okay? And thanks to that gift, we are remade. We're God's handiwork. Equipped for what? Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay? Notice, please. Oh, why isn't Luther here tonight? <laughs> Notice, please. There isn't a hint of tension in the verses we just heard between God's grace and our good works. Huh? It's not works or grace, for heaven's sake. Grace is the empowerment to works. It's the retooling of our nature to make us ready, willing, and able to do them. Okay. From these basic data in the scripture, let's hear some remarks that the fathers of the church made about this mysterious entity called grace. Uh, way back at the beginning of Christian literature, there is a document called the Letter of Barnabas. Okay? Now, needless to say, all of the historical critics for generations have been saying, well, have Barnabas, that's got to be a pseudonym. It doesn't come from the man mentioned in the Bible. Oh, yeah? There's really no reason why not. And there are scholars today who are dating this book as early as the 80s of the first century. So, it says it's by Barnabas. Maybe it is. Here it says, In renewing us through the forgiveness of sins, God has put on us a new imprint to the point of having the soul of a small child, just as if he had created us all over again. Hmm? There it is. Epistle of Barnabas, uh, chapter 6. Tertullian, all right, he was a crank. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was very good on the subject of baptism. He taught that baptism uh, gives us a special resemblance with God, different from the resemblance that we have by our nature. Okay? Since we're intelligent beings, have free will, we have a certain resemblance to God in our nature. But baptism provides something over and above that, vastly superior. That's our real assimilation to God. Right? Let me read you uh, something here from St. Basil. By the way, um, if I were a better man, I wouldn't be lecturing to you in my own words tonight. I would have brought St. Basil's wonderful little book on the Holy Spirit. I'd be reading to you straight. It's the best little book on the Holy Spirit ever written. Anyway, he says that the Holy Spirit is in the soul, rather as a form is in matter, 
or rather as the power to see is in the eye, or as art is in the artist. The Holy Spirit is always united to a righteous person, but he's not always producing in that person special effects like prophecies, miracles of healing, and so on. I um, cannot pass over my favorite quotation from the Fathers of the Church on this subject. It is by St. Cyril of Alexandria. All right? Now, Cyril of Alexandria was uh, a tough guy. I mean, the way he rode down his enemies at the time of the council, it, it, it was wonderful. He was the, 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 the principal leader of the church of the Council of Ephesus. Anyway, listen to this from his commentary on the book of Isaiah. He says, there is for man a flat out formation as when our first ancestor, Adam, was formed from the earth. Okay? After this mode of creation, there is another formation, which is unique to each of us. It happens when each of us is formed in the womb of his mother, and this is how we come into existence. After that, he says, there is another formation. We're up to three now. A third formation in which we become children of God, elevated in our minds through knowledge of God's laws. Elevated to what? Listen to this. Elevated to a supernatural beauty. Elevated to a supernatural beauty, which procures for our soul the adornment of the virtues. This beauty is spiritual beauty. Okay. It is, this, this third formation is at the same time formation in Christ, formation to the image of Christ through participation in the Holy Spirit. Christ is formed in us thanks to the Holy Spirit who introduces into our souls a certain divine form through sanctification and righteousness. Period, unquote. Okay? Cyril of Alexandria, very heavyweight thinker, and notice how he suggests a difference between the Holy Spirit and what we get in this third formation. He says the Holy Spirit introduces, let me read it again. He introduces into our souls a certain divine form through sanctification and righteousness. If that divine form is grace, then it's a gift from the Holy Spirit and not exactly the Holy Spirit himself. Now, as you know, after the time of the Church Fathers, all of these matters were debated again in the Middle Ages and uh, debated in great detail by a movement called the Scholastic Movement, so-called after the fact that the participants were working in a university setting. They were academic professors of theology for the most part, or they taught in religious orders. Okay. And they certainly confronted 
this topic, which was not settled at the time, and about which the church has said surprisingly little. Okay? The Council of Trent has a remark relevant to our topic, but here's what it says. Our justification does not consist solely in the remission of sins, but in the sanctification and renewal of the inner man through the willing reception of grace and the gifts. Dot, dot, dot. Trent continues. The sole formal cause of this justification is the righteousness of God, dash. Not the righteousness with which he himself is righteous, but the one with which he makes us righteous. Hmm? Through this righteousness received from God, we are renewed and we really are righteous. We receive righteousness into ourselves and each receives it in the measure which the Holy Spirit determines and according to each one's disposition. Okay. Now then, that's the last word of the church on this question of exactly what grace and the Holy Spirit have to do with one another Okay, uh, and it is um, a very important point. But remember, Trent came at the end of all the medieval debates. During the medieval debates themselves, huge questions were wide open. And I want to uh, begin by putting a name on the board. Very good man, Peter Lombard. The Lombards were barbarians who came down and occupied northern Italy. That's why we have blonde people sometimes in northern Italy. Lombard blood. This Peter was from Lombardy, and he became Archbishop of Paris. In, oh, 1150-something like that. And it's a very important man for our purposes because... Peter Lombard is the most important link you can look at between the fathers of the church and the scholastics who came in the subsequent centuries. Because Peter Lombard collected together all of the opinions he could find on the church, in the church fathers in which they seemed to be on both sides of a question. He collected all of the apparent conflicts in the fathers and set out to resolve them, okay? And so he called his work the Four Books of Opinions. Libri Quatri Sententiarum means Four Books of Opinions, okay? Don't say Four Books of Sentences. That's the dumbest translation of that book's title I've ever heard in my life. What does any book consist of but sentences, for heaven's sake? It's the four books of opinions about how to reconcile difficulties left by the church fathers. Well, he had a hand at it. And on our topic tonight, he was something of a radical. He maintained that grace is not a created reality infused into our souls, but is the Holy Spirit himself producing love for God in us. Okay? In explaining this, Lombard says that the Holy Spirit is a formal cause of our justification. He comes into our souls. He's what makes us righteous. He produces love of God in our souls. No such thing as a created entity called grace, said Peter Lombard. Okay? And Lombard's four books of sentences were the school textbook for theologians down into the 17th, even the 18th century. Okay. 
So, and all the big guys commented on him. On the point I just gave you, not many people agreed with him. Peter Lombard complained, nobody follows my opinion on this. And hardly anybody follows it to this day. But it's certainly an interesting opinion, and there's just one little technicality that I think I need to explain to you if you are to get his opinion clear in your mind. It's the difference between a formal cause and an efficient cause. Formal cause versus efficient cause. See, my handwriting was terrible when I was a child, and it has been getting worse and worse and worse. I used to be able to write legibly on the blackboard. I don't know what's happening to me. Anyway, I want you to understand the difference between a formal cause and an efficient cause, and to do so, I need to tell you about white paint. Yep, white paint. What makes white paint? Well, if you're asking about the efficient cause, the answer is the manufacturer, for crying out loud. <laughs> He's got a factory. It's full of machines. These are the tools through which he makes the stuff. Next question. What makes the paint white? And this time, it won't do just to say the manufacturer. What makes the paint white is something in its chemical structure. Isn't that right? Yeah. That's a formal cause. When you hear formal cause, think structure. Think of a structure. That which makes a white thing be white is its whiteness, and that's the formal cause. Trent says that the formal cause, the sole formal cause of our being justified, our righteousness, is the righteousness of God. But rather, a righteousness with which he makes us righteous. So, okay, Trent seems to me is applying the white paint solution to this theological problem. Hey, it's not a bad comparison. It's in the Bible. Though your sins be as crimson, you shall be white as snow, right? Ah. <laughs> okay. The efficient cause of our righteousness is the Holy Spirit, and the formal cause of our righteousness is what he's giving to us. A grace, an empowerment, a new life with which we are formally holy, just as through its whiteness the paint is formally white. Make sense to everybody? As a result, the opinion of Peter Lombard has no defenders anymore. Now then. In the aftermath of Peter Lombard's writing, there were two equations that the theologians were studying. Okay? They were equations involving sanctifying grace. One equation said, sanctifying grace is identically the Holy Spirit. That's what Peter Lombard was saying. It's not a created thing, it's the Holy Spirit himself. It is the general opinion of theologians that the Council of Trent has shot down this equation. Okay? Now you might be able to wiggle around it, but let's not try. All right? The consensus is that that equation is wrong. However, there was another consensus. I mean, sorry, there was another equation, which was very much in debate at this time. Doesn't it say in the Bible that what the Holy Spirit pours forth into our hearts is the love of God? Wouldn't it stand to reason then 
that the grace by which we are saved, justified, and so on, is identically love for God. That's the second equation. And we have a special name in theology for love that we have towards God. What is that special name? Charity, yes. Infused charity. Continuing the quiz. Infused charity is one of the three theological what? Yeah. So, it's a virtue. Love for God, infused charity, the chief virtue. Uh -huh. Okay. This was another lovely debate. And this time, the debate is by no means closed. Okay? Against this second equation, saying that sanctifying grace is not quite the same thing as love for God, was St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, Suarez, lots of people. But in favor of this second equation was the great Franciscan theologian Duns Scotus. And after his time, St. Robert Bellarmine, the genius who waged our war for us uh, against uh, the Reformation. Okay? So Scotus, Bellarmine, and, and, and others have defended this second equation. All right. Since there are good theologians on both sides of this, you might wonder, what's our stake in it? I mean, really? Look, if you, def if you defend this equation over here, you're probably next door to heresy. Watch it. But if you defend this one over here, you've got lots of friends in high places in the church. Don't worry about it. So I'm not saying that this is going to lead you astray, but I do think that there is a reason why St. Thomas, a good reason why St. Thomas was not satisfied with this second equation. He was not satisfied with it because he believed that grace in our souls, which is an effect of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the efficient cause, but his effect in our soul, sanctifying grace, was deeper than the virtue of of love for God. Okay? Before we go on, I want to um, clarify an issue for you which um, I think bothers a lot of people. And um, I've often had to uh, teach this to my students. <sighs> what is the love for God that you are supposed to have in your soul. What is that? Oftentimes, people say that they don't feel very good about themselves, about their friendship with God, because they, they don't feel that they really love God all that deeply. All right? And I think the reason for this is because they think of the love of God on the model of the love that a man would have for a woman or a woman for a man. In other words, romantic love. Okay? When you are romantically in love with somebody, there are lots of good effects, usually. <laughs> lots of good effects. Uh, you want to be with that person. You want to spend time with that person. You want to talk to that person. So to this extent, it's a good model. If you were in love with God the way you're in love with a girlfriend, you want to talk to him. That's prayer. That's good. But at a certain point, that model breaks down because romantic love 
is not a pure love of friendship. Okay? Romantic love is also what we call desire love. Okay? Oh, well, the Latin for this is perfectly dreadful. Amor concupiscentiae. Desire love. Okay. When you say, I love chocolate, that's amor concupiscentiae. <laughs> it appeals to one of your appetites. Okay. And uh, there is typically, let's hope almost always, a considerable attraction for the uh, sexual qualities of the opposite person that's involved in falling in love with that person. And that's the, the desire element that goes into romantic love. Love of God, on the other hand, is pure friendship love, okay? Love for God is not like thirsting for him the way a drunk thirsts for scotch. It's not like hungering for him the way a chocoholic hungers for chocolate. It's not desiring so much some quality that he has so much as it is wanting to serve him. Okay? When you have friendship love for somebody, what do you want to do? You want to help them out. They need something, you want to do it for them. That's what friendship is for, isn't it? When you love God... You want to do things for him. You want to work with him for the salvation of the world, for the renewal of our institutions, for the blessing and salvation of our children, and so on. Loving God is desiring passionately to be his accomplice in all that he seeks to achieve. Well, of course, he seeks to achieve some things in you. As he does seek to achieve things in me. Okay? This is where wanting to be his accomplice becomes hard. Okay? As long as I see God's work as overhauling you. <laughs> well, I ask. I'm a very willing accomplice. <laughs> when I see that his work involves overhauling me, eh, eh, well, all right. So in this way, the love for word God, towards God touches, you know, everything he's trying to do in terms of the work he's doing to clean up my own act and yours and so on. Yes. So love of God is friendship love, amor amicitiae in Latin, amor amicitiae, love of friendship, not desire. So don't feel bad if... Uh, you know, you, you don't feel emotionally drawn to God the way you would feel towards your latest love life attraction. Um, don't beat yourself up over that. But reflect on how deeply you want to work with God, serve him, Further his cause. Okay? Further his cause. All right. Now then, why did St. Thomas think that this wonderful attitude with, by which we want to work with God, serve God, be his friend and collaborator in the salvation of the world, why didn't he think that was deep enough to capture the reality of what God's sanctifying grace is in us? He lays out his answer by making a comparison between the new nature we have through grace and the old nature that we have through our birth. And here's what he says. Look, all 
diverse natures have diverse ends or purposes. Different natures have different ends, purposes. And in natural cases, in order for a thing to reach its end, it has to have three items already. Okay? It has to have a nature proportioned to that end. It has to have a natural inclination towards that end, which is a natural seeking after it. And thirdly, it has to have a way of moving or acting towards that end. So um, we can take an example from the animal kingdom. Okay, let's suppose, this is a crazy example, but let's suppose that beavers exist to build dams in rivers. Okay. That's what they're for in nature. I'm not a good enough zoologist to know whether that's true, but let's just say it's true. Okay. Well, if building these muddy dams is a beaver's end, then to reach that end, it has to have three things already. First of all, it's got to have a nature that's proportioned to that end. Yeah. They swim. They can handle the water. They can slap around the mud with those marvelous tails of theirs. They're good. They have a nature proportioned to that end. They have a natural inclination towards that end. Okay? You go ahead and bring, uh, you know, a couple of dozen beavers into a river near you and try to keep them from damming it up. They have an inclination, and they have a way of acting that contributes towards reaching this end. Sure they do. Just as birds know by instinct how to make nests. The beavers know what to do. Yeah. All right. Aquinas says we see this in man. Man is proportioned in accordance with his nature to a certain end, after which he has a natural seeking, and he can operate or move with his natural strengths to reach that end. Okay. Aquinas thought that our natural end was a certain contemplation of the deepest truths. Okay. He called it philosophical contemplation of divine things. Okay? First causes, ultimate purposes, understanding those deepest things is what man is for. Okay? Said Aquinas. I don't want to take time tonight to defend that opinion. Okay? To most people, this sounds like an egghead ruminating <laughs> on what he's done with his life. All right, I think it's a little better than that, but never mind. He says we have this end to which we're proportioned by our nature. Okay? It's to get at the truth. We have a natural seeking for that, natural tendency towards that, and we can move, operate appropriately to get there by collecting evidence, examining arguments, etc. Okay. It was in this contemplation of the truth that the philosophers said man's ultimate happiness lay. It turns out, however, Aquinas goes on, it turns out that there is an end for which man is being prepared by God, an end that exceeds the proportion of human nature, namely eternal life. And this end lies in seeing God through his essence. Yes. This is eternal life, says St. John, that they might know thee, the true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Okay? Knowing God, seeing him as he is in himself, is the heart and core of everlasting life. And it's way beyond the proportion of human nature. 
because that feat exceeds any created nature. Okay. What equipment do you have to see God? Zilch. As far as natural equipment you're born with is concerned, zilch. Okay, okay. What equipment can you gain by education for seeing God? Zero. You will learn by your education to avoid some bad ideas. You will learn by your education to sort out the good analogous knowledge of God from baloney. But that's not seeing. And nothing in your education can take away the desperate necessity for believing. Am I right? And we believe because we don't see. Right? Yeah. So we have no natural equipment for seeing God, but God says that this is what he's calling us to do. To spend eternity face to face with him. Okay. It must be the case, therefore, that man is given something through which he not only operates towards this end or through which his seeking is inclined towards it, but also something through which man's very nature is reproportioned. Something through which our very nature is elevated to the dignity at which such an end would be what our nature is for. And this, he says, is why grace is given. Love for God is given to incline the affection towards this end. Okay? Grace raises your whole nature to proportion it to this end. Okay? Supernatural infused charity is promoting or improving your will. It resides in the will, and it is tuning up your will to make you desire in a lively way the good as God sees it. Okay. I don't need any tuning up to pursue the good as I see it. Uh-uh. Okay. I am all over that. But to pursue the good as God sees it, ah, that takes enlightenment, improving of my mind, and it takes a strengthening in my will, and let's face it, it takes a certain redirection of my will, okay? Here again, the analogy of friendship is a good one. Sure it is. Let's suppose that I have been a friend of yours for years and years, okay? And we've been through some thick and some thin together, and I helped you out with this, and you helped me out with that. We have cooperated often. We're good friends. In all those years, my will has been being trained up, okay, so that I can really put your interest ahead of my own. Well, at least sometimes. Okay. And put your interest ahead of my own. That takes training because the interest I naturally put first is guess who's mine. Friendship is a wonderful training ground in putting somebody else's interest first. Isn't it nice that friendship is another aspect of romantic love? Yeah? Isn't it nice that, that married life trains up wives and husbands to put the other's interest first? To a degree. <laughs> In good marriages to a very considerable degree. Okay. So that's what love for God is doing. It is 
enhancing our will, okay? And then we are given other active virtues to bring forth hope, bring forth assent, the assent of faith, okay? Active virtues to do various uh, acts of Christian self-sacrifice, Christian self-discipline. Yeah. We get all, we get a whole string of active virtues so that we may do what? So that we may act, move, operate towards the end, which is seeing God forever in heaven. Okay? So the bottom line is this. With the Holy Spirit, we are being given, or by the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, we are being given something called sanctifying grace, which is a genuinely new kind of life in us. It's not the life of the body. It's a genuinely new kind of life, okay, in which we are after another end than what we were born for and in which we are equipped with other virtues than we can acquire by our practice. Yes. When this church talks about the supernatural, okay, the church is not joking. That word means the nature above ours. We're getting a new nature above our own nature. We are raised up to that new nature by a gift which is really in us. But that new nature is making us children of God. Okay? And that makes sense now. The talk about grace is making us adoptive sons and daughters of God. Now it makes sense. Look. If what grace is doing is tuning us up on the very level of our nature so that we've got a new nature now, then we're somebody else's children now, right? Yeah. To be a child of somebody is to get your nature from them. Yeah. And to be an adoptive child is to be an outside person freely taken into the family. You're in the family if you have the same nature as the rest of the family. You're an adoptive family member if you're an outside person taken into it. Well, that's us. Okay. We were originally outside people. We were born children of wrath. Not children of God, but children of men. Okay? And we had no hope for the long term. But what? Politics? <laughs> a peaceful world? Give me a break. Okay. I have often said, as a theologian, I believe in many things hard to believe in. But I have never believed in anything as absurd as a permanently peaceful world. Brought, out by, brought about by human politics. I'm sorry, that's beyond me. But when we were children of men and children of wrath, what other hope did we have? Yes. But now we have been raised up to this new hope. We are outside persons brought into the family of God. That's what adoption is. We're his sons and daughters by having a share in his nature. That new nature is the formal cause in us whereby we are righteous according to the Council of Trent. Okay? That, I think, is all we need to say for tonight by way of putting together the major pieces of this debate about the Holy Spirit and grace. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marshner. We'll take a quick break for those that can stay around for a quick question-answer period. Okay, our, our usual rules apply. Uh, we'll have a maximum of five questions and uh, make sure your question has to do with the topic at hand. 
um, make sure that it is one sentence long. So if you have to take a breath, it's too long. Uh, make sure it has a question mark on the end, and don't you dare try to take the microphone from my hand. <laughs> All right. Questions? Hi. I'm, I may be overthinking this, but um, were you saying that, that grace gives us a new end and, gives, and proportions our nature to that end, and then that charity fixes the natural inclination and gives us the way of acting? Was that what you were saying, or...? Nature, inclination, actions, all oriented towards a thing's end, okay, in one way or another. The basic ingredient is the nature. It's got to be, in some sense, proportioned to that end. Okay, we had a question over here. Yes. May I ask a question about last week's presentation? Yes. That's good. See, if, you, if you're wondering, just ask me, and I'll give you the rules again, okay? <laughs> Well, it, it had to do with, with the Holy Spirit as the giver of life. Yes. And as I was doing the rosary on Wednesday, I wondered, was there anything to be said about the role of the Holy Spirit in the resurrection? Oh, yes. Anything to, does the Holy Spirit have a role in the resurrection? Because he's the giver of life. Yes, indeed, he does. The, uh, the vision in Ezekiel... Um, certainly suggests as much. The spirit comes from the four corners and these bones live again. Hmm? Um, it's like this. Wherever Christ is the model, the Holy Spirit is the means. Wherever Christ is the what... The Holy Spirit is the how. Okay. Our resurrection is modeled on that of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. But the Holy Spirit is the one through whom we receive the down payment of the resurrection already in this life. Okay. The Holy Spirit is called the 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 deposit or the down payment on eternal life, okay? And indeed, uh, the Holy Spirit will quicken our mortal bodies, okay? That we may be raised up on the image of Christ as living members of his body. If you're wondering why there were so many uh, comments by Dr. Marshner about love, and, and in devotion and desire and so forth. It's because Mrs. Marshner is here with us tonight, so we can. <laughs> I won't go that side with you. <laughs> but, um, not too many people here may be as distract distractible as I am, but you were having that microphone trouble just as you were describing and defining the difference between the formal cause and the efficient cause and explaining why uh, Peter Lombard didn't hold water. Could you go over that again? Well, okay. Lombard was suggesting that the Holy Spirit comes into our souls the way whiteness comes into the structure of paint. Okay? So, in that formal way, he would be making our souls holy, producing love towards God in our souls making them holy the way the chemistry of white paint makes the paint white, okay? That theory really does not stand up, first of all, to the positions that we can quote from the church fathers. If you look again at that quotation from St. Cyril of Alexandria, it's quite clear that he's saying that the Holy Spirit is producing in us this divine form, and it's by that divine form that we are righteous and holy and so on. So the Holy Spirit is not the form, he's the giver of the form. Right? That, I think, is the most important argument. However, when we have world enough in time, we can pile metaphysical arguments on top of that one. Okay? If we had all night 
we could go into the question, can the divine being enter into a created substance, like you, so as to serve as its form, in the same way as your soul serves as your form in your natural life? Can a divine being thus enter into a created substance and work there, act there as a formal cause? Okay? Giving us what? An accidental quality? I know it's an accidental quality because I don't know about your righteousness, but I can lose mine. Okay? My righteousness is here today and gone tomorrow. No, 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 no. It was absent yesterday and here today. That's, that sounds better. <laughs> My righteousness is like an accidental quality. Are you, you going to say that the divine being becomes an accident of mine? I don't think so. And Aquinas has, of course, the usual philosophical arguments why God can't act as a, like a restricted cause of something in a creature. I mean, my goodness, formal causes are supposed to make things a certain way, and that certain way is the way the form is. Yeah? So, whiteness makes paint white. Okay? And humanness makes blobs of cells human beings. Yeah. And wouldn't the divine being acting as a formal cause make something God? Huh? In other words, it's hard to see how we could have the divine nature by participation if we really had the divine essence or the divine form or divine person directly at work within us. Okay? Seems to me we'd, we'd each be just flat out divinized. Uh, Dr. Morrisner, I have one question concerning the efficient cause concept. If the spirit is really the efficient cause in us of the grace, then in a way doesn't that sort of cheapen grace, make it sort of like divine dollars in the sense that if he's a depositor of that, whatever we call grace, we haven't really defined it so much. How can we say simply he's the efficient cause and he doles out grace from some divine bank? And in a way, that seems like we always have to make sure our you know, deposits are coming and we have to check our account all the time, as opposed to just being free enough to you know, live the Christian life. When I say that God, and especially the Holy Spirit, is the efficient cause of grace, what we're saying is that he makes it. I mean, it's not as though it's made already, stored in a vault in heaven, and all he does is distribute it. That's not the picture at all. Okay? God is directly producing that newness of life in us, which makes us be new creatures. So it, it, it really is a case of recreation because we're given a retuned, reproportioned nature. Okay? And that retuning, that reproportion, that ennoblement, that supernaturalization doesn't exist anywhere but in the individuals whom God benefits in this way. There's no bank in heaven. Celestial reserve, no. It's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's produced in our nature to elevate our nature. If I had never been baptized, so I never had the Holy Spirit come in me, yep. and I do not have my nature then elevated to the supernatural, what am I then as a person compared to a person who has been baptized? Am I not capable of doing good or capable of advancing God's work 
If you had two of me side by side, one baptized and one not, could you tell a difference? I sure hope so. A person who is baptized and living in the power of the Holy Spirit should be living a life that looks substantially different from an ordinary human life. This is not to say that ordinary human life won't have some good deeds in it. Okay? There was a school of theology, thank goodness it's about extinct now, that said that without the help of grace, man never does any good at all. Okay? But without, what do you mean? Without the help of divine grace, I can't select a tie that goes with my shirt? No, I mean, there are kinds of good that are, the doing of which is within the scope of unaided human nature. But those kinds of good do not contribute in any way towards anyone's getting to heaven. Heaven is a supernatural affair. You've got to be supernaturalized to get into it. Except a man be born again of water and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay? Those who are not born again of water and the Spirit cannot enter. They're well enough equipped for this world and its kingdoms, but not for the kingdom of God. Okay? So, and I, I do believe that there are kinds of good, specifically salvific kinds of good, which an unbaptized person cannot do. I know that it is possible to receive justification apart from sacramental baptism. Somebody can be saved through what we call the baptism of blood, dying in martyrdom for our Lord. And there may be other ways as well. But the point is the person has to be supernaturalized in order to do these acts. Okay? I want you to consider what may seem to you like a very simple thing. It's called the act of faith. Without the grace of God, you can't do it. You can't do it. Oh, I know you can mouth Christian opinions without the grace of God. But can you really assent to these things as to God speaking if you're not enabled to do so? by grace and the infused gift of faith. Okay. Infused faith is a strengthening of the intellect. So you can, as, you can ascend to these things that are hard to see. It's a strength to ascend. And to ascend in a special way. Okay. Not just as, oh, it's probably right. Yeah, my grandma used to say that. It's probably right. Yeah, all my ancestors taught that. I'm sure it's right. No, no, no. It's assenting to it as the very word of God. Okay? You assent to it. You believe it because God says it, and for no other reason. That's hard. Okay? I'm not sure that any person, apart from super... I'm, I'm, well, I'm quite sure. Apart from supernatural gifts, a person cannot love God in the way we're talking about here, okay? Look, without grace, I can have, oh, a broad conception of what all would be good to do, okay? So as to sort of benefit the whole world, yes, Without the gift of grace, I can form in myself the plan, get this, to leave the world a better place for my having lived in it. All right? And I, I mean, sure, God is sort of the, you know, the main guy running the universe, and if I leave it a better place, that's eh. But 
the love of God that comes in the heart of a Christian is an interpersonal love. Okay? Not a love for some abstract good or not something like love for one's country. It's interpersonal. Yes? It is to love God as the one who will make us blessed. Because that is his wonderful will. So with gratitude for his personal love for us, we want to cooperate with him. I don't think you can do that without grace. Okay? Now I know there's a dispute about this. I don't want to quote the theologians on the other side. But I think that there are things that contribute to our salvation, works of a salvific character, that really cannot be done unless you have supernaturalized faculties. Thank okay? you, Dr. Marshner. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.